Okay, so if you are taking notes this morning, we got a really good title for this message, and we stole it right from the chapter, okay? The title of this message this morning for Revelation chapter 12 is The Woman, the Man-Child, and the Dragon, okay? Sounds like a crazy book, right, that you might read, but this is, this is what we're going to be looking at this morning in chapter 12, are some, uh, and, and I want to... Uh, let you know this as we dive into chapter 12. We talked about this as we started the book of Revelation, that there is much symbolism in this book. And in fact, chapter 12 and 13 have uh, uh, these two chapters. We're going to just look at 12 this morning, but uh, these next two chapters have much of or most of the symbolism in Revelation are in these two chapters. And John, right off the get-go, says in verse 1 of, of Revelation chapter 12, he says, and a great sign appeared in heaven. So as we enter into this chapter, we want to know this, that John is telling us that what we are about to read and what he saw, this vision that he saw, he is saying that they were a sign, a, a picture of something. And he says a sign appeared in heaven. He also repeats that in verse 3 of this chapter that he says, and another sign appeared in heaven. And uh, so these, these characters of chapter 12 that we're going to see and dig into this morning, these are a picture of something. So as it's described, we want to, as we talk about the woman, the child, and the dragon, we're going to see who specifically he is making reference to. So he says in verse 1, again, the opening, he says, And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head, a crown of 12 stars. John actually uh, uses uh, women in Revelation as a sign in, in a few chapters. He actually um, talks about Jezebel in chapter 2, who represented paganism. He uh, talks about in chapter 17, which we'll see in a few weeks, he talks about the scarlet whore that we'll look at. And then he also talks about in chapter 19, the wife of the lamb. Guess who that is? Us right here. We are the bride of Christ. So he, he uses these signs. Again, they are a picture of something. So we're going to look at the woman and who is this woman that John is talking about that's clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and on her head, a crown of 12 stars. Well, there are a few different thoughts on who this woman is. First off, it's important to know this. The Catholic Church has typically leaned towards this as being Mary, that they believe this is Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now, in fact, the Catholic Church puts a lot of emphasis on Mary, sometimes even more than Jesus. And, and uh, Jesus is it. Amen. Jesus is it. Mary was awesome, but Jesus is it. He's the son of God. And, and they lean towards this being possibly Mary. But here's the thing that's important to know. Many times in the Old Testament, uh, God used a picture for describing Israel. And in fact, Israel many times, just as like the church today, is described as the bride of Christ. Israel was the wife of Yahweh. In fact, if you've never read the book of Hosea in the Old Testament, it's all about Israel the wife of Yahweh being unfaithful to God by going after other gods, by going after idolatry. And again, it's very, throughout Scripture, it's woven through that Israel was pictured as the bride or the wife of God, and then the church now is the bride of Christ. So we, we lean towards this, and here's why. We're going to have a cool verse we're going to look at. But we believe this, that the woman here in chapter 12 is not Mary. Uh, this woman is not an individual woman that he's talking about. In fact, there was, let me see if I can find her name here. Um, there was a lady, this is in, was in the 1700s, and her name was Joanna Southcott, and she was a self-proclaimed prophetess. And I thought this was interesting. I've never heard of this woman before, but maybe you have. But she uh, believed that this woman in Revelation 12, she started informing her followers, which she gained close to, I think, 200,000 followers. 
she believed and told people that it was her. That this woman was her. And uh, we're going to even see that this woman is going to give birth here in chapter 12. And she proclaimed that she would give birth to this child that Revelation 12 was talking about. Well, guess what? She died in the 1800s and never gave birth to a child, a man child, and was never the woman that is described here. We believe that the woman here in chapter 12 is Israel. This is what we're looking at. John is saying that a great sign appeared in heaven, and he describes this woman, and, and he describes this woman, and then her description is where we find that this is Israel, that John is making reference to Israel. Here's what's cool. Turn with me to the very first book of the Bible, Genesis. Genesis chapter 37. Genesis 37. And if you are there, let me know. Okay. How many of you guys like this humid weather? No? Okay. I was just talking to Richard before service, and we were talking about how humid it is in the Philippines. So we, we've got it easy here. But All right, so Genesis 37, we're going to see something very interesting. We're going to start in verse 1, and it says this. To give a little background here, it says, Jacob lived in the land of his fathers, uh, sojournings in the land of Canaan. These are the generations, verse 2, Genesis 37, of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's uh, wives, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brother saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they, ha they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Okay, so we're not going to get into a, a study of Joseph this morning, but just keep in mind, we already know this, that Joseph is a tattletale. Okay, it tells us right here that he would go and give a bad report of his other brothers to his father. Um, maybe he was, you know, doing a good job by doing that, but his brothers looked at him as a rat. You know, you're, you're getting us in trouble. And then all of a sudden, the father makes him this robe of many colors, favors him, loves him because he's the son of his old age. So his brothers begin to hate him. Okay? And it says there in verse 3 that Joseph, uh, that Israel, Jacob, loved him more than any other of his sons. Dangerous. Very dangerous for a parent to find themselves in a place like this. But when his brother saw it, and then it tells us that they uh, hated him even more, <coughs> um, and they could not even speak to him peacefully. Now Joseph, verse 5, had a dream, and we told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. This guy's on a roll. He said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves gathered around it, and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Verse 9, Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers, verse 11, were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Very important here in, Re in uh, Revelation chapter 12, 1, again, this woman her description is that she was clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. Joseph's dream includes each one of these things, the sun, the moon, and the stars. And as Jacob, who is Israel, hears this dream, he responds to him and rebukes him. And he answers with 
acknowledging that the moon, the sun, and the stars are himself, his wife, and his children. Are you saying that we're going to bow down and worship you? So we know that Jacob, who became Israel, and now we see here this woman in Revelation 12, that she's clothed in the very description that Joseph had in this dream back in Genesis 37 of, you're going to bow down and worship me. And, and Jacob, Israel, responds and says, you're saying the moon, the sun, the stars. You're, you're saying that we, that I, am going to bow down before you? So in Revelation 12, we can make our way back there. This is who we are seeing as the sign of a woman. <clears throat> and let's go on. We know this verse 2. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Again, a sign, a picture of something. Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all nations, verse 5, with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she, was, where she has a place prepared by God in which she, is she, which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. Okay, so we have the woman, and now we have the red dragon. And the red dragon, we believe this, which is very evident, that the red dragon is Satan. So you have Israel. In Israel, we see that she's this description of a woman is pregnant with child. Who's the child? Jesus. Jesus is the child that Israel is pregnant with. And you might be very confused and saying, well, how was a nation pregnant? Well, what John is, is painting for us here, what he's seeing, this vision, what he's describing to us is that Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, came through Israel was not only born in Israel, but was born through the lineage of Israel. And, and here this woman, Israel, is pregnant with child. If you remember Isaiah 9, 6 says, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. That was Isaiah talking to Israel, saying, Israel, unto us, through us, a son will be born. <coughs> this son this child that we see here that the woman is pregnant with is Jesus himself. Romans 9, 4, and 5 says this, They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Israel, we need to know this, folks. Israel is very important. Very important. Israel, the Jews are God's, if you know this, his what? Chosen people. We know that Israel, all through the Old Testament, Israel was the prominent figure of God pursuing Israel, going after Israel. Israel finding themselves again, like the book of Hosea, constantly going after those that were around them. God saying, you don't need a king. I'm, I'm your, I am your God. But we want to be like everybody else around us. We want to be like all the other nations. Then they pursued what everybody else had. And God continued to pursue them with his love and ultimately the ultimate pursuit of sending his only begotten son, Jesus. The woman Israel, the child Jesus. And then as we see the child we see right away the dragon, the red dragon. And the red dragon has some things that, that describe just like the woman we saw with the sun and the moon and the stars. And we're going to get into a little more of these next week as we're in chapter 13. But the red dragon, as we see in verse 3, 
uh, we see that <clears throat> he had uh, seven heads, ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. We're going to get into this a little more next week as far as what are these horns, what are these heads, what are these diadems, but we know this, that Satan has always been after the pursuit of power. Power. Satan has always been after the pursuit of power. In fact, we'll put this up on the screens, but you guys might be familiar with this passage from Isaiah. Isaiah 14 says this, how you are fallen from heaven, talking about the devil, again, who was an angel in heaven. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn, how you are cut down to the ground. You who laid the nations low, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will, I will sit on the, amount, on the mount of the assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. I, 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 I. See, Satan craved power. Satan craved power. Satan craved position, and he wanted to be above God. And we're going to see as this unfolds in this chapter, as we see him pictured here with these diadems, he is going, and he does actually have power today here on earth. And most of his power is through nations. And during this time of tribulation that is to come, we're going to see that he will align people together under his authority and his headship and his power. But ultimately, it's so that he can be worshipped. He can be worshipped. That is his desire, ultimately, is that he would be worshipped. Look what it says also in verse 4. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. These stars we're going to see just in a few verses are actually angels that actually fell with Satan. That rebelled with Satan. That he took with him. But we see as the child again is mentioned in the woman, we see that the red dragon, the great dragon, he is standing before the woman waiting for the child to be born so that he may devour it. Reminds me of Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. If you remember Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, God said this after the fall. And he said this specifically to Satan. I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This was talking about the seed that would come through woman, Jesus, right after the fall. God's again, his pursuit. Jesus would come. And there has always been enmity between the devil and Israel. And the devil has always gone after Israel because the devil knew that Jesus would be coming through Israel. So here we see that he's, this picture that he's standing and devouring. These are things that have already happened. John's describing. Jesus was already born, amen? Can you guys believe, I don't know if you've been in any stores lately, but I walked into Costco yesterday. We walked into Costco, and there's trees already up. Trees and all the Christmas decorations are already out, and they're like competing with the Halloween decorations. There's like a battle going on, a battle between evil and good, you know, and I'm just kidding, but I think it's a little too early when you're literally walking into a store and you're like, you know, it was August yesterday. I don't know why we have Christmas decorations, but I got to share this, uh, and I've, sh I've shared it probably a hundred times, so I'm, that proves that I'm getting old when you guys hear the same stories over and over again, but, um, and, and, uh, and if you've heard the story, I want you to raise, no, I'm, I'm just kidding, but Christmas, since it's coming so quickly, Christmas will be here next week. Um, we, we have, I actually gave it back to my, my mom, but we had a large, about six foot tall, maybe a little shorter, but angel that my grandfather had cut out of wood and painted and gold wings that he had put out for their nativity out in their lawn. And 
we we took it one year and we put it in um you know brought it home and put it out one year and then halloween came and our neighbors um they they go they went out this this set of neighbors would always go all out for halloween i mean they would go crazy and they they had this seven foot tall devil right that was right on the corner of their house but also at the time both my boys were in the room, their room together, as they roomed together, and they were probably, I don't know, under nine years old, probably younger, and, um, and I'm just thinking, here's this devil all night long standing outside their bedroom window. So it's Halloween, I decided, what a perfect time to bring the angel out and put it right on our side of our house facing the, the devil. So it was, it was good, it was a battle, and they, I was doing it kind of like, ha, 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 you know, and they, I think they got really, oh gosh, we've offended them. You know, we had better take the devil down. So it was good. But Jesus is the issue of why Satan has enmity with Israel. God's chosen people, but he knew that Jesus would come through Israel. And here we see that he's ready and waiting to devour the child. If you remember the story of Jesus' birth, Matthew chapter 2, the wise men, actually after Jesus was born, went to pursue to find Jesus to what? Worship him. I want you to keep that thought in your mind, worship. And as they pursued the star in the sky, they ran into King Herod. And they let King Herod know what they were doing. We're going to go worship this new king, the king of the Jews that was born. And Herod hears this news in Matthew chapter 2, and Herod plays along with them. All right, when you go and see him, you come back, give me word where he's at, and I'll come myself and bring him gifts and worship him. And we know that Herod was, was lying, and we know after that that the wise men did not return back to Herod, and Herod had every child under the age of two killed in the area of Bethlehem where Jesus was born. The devil tried to devour the child. Again, how does he work? Well, he works through nations. He works through kings. He works through rulers. He works through all sorts of things. Herod tried to devour Jesus as a baby. But guess what? Didn't happen. Didn't happen. We're going to wrap up here because as he tries to devour the child, we see something else happen in verse 6. We know he was not successful because it says, actually verse 5, that she gave birth to a male child, one who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne, and the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. Okay, very important we look at these, this verse right here because um, there can be confusion again. If you remember, um, Jesus, when he was a child, um, an angel came to Joseph and told Joseph to flee where? Do you remember? Anybody remember? Egypt. Okay. So some will then again go back and go, well, this must be again talking about Mary because Mary and Joseph fled with Jesus to the wilderness, in a sense, to Egypt. But no, there is a a timeline given, 1,260 days. Very important to hold on to this. Because if you remember, last Sunday we looked at chapter 11, and the two witnesses, they were appointed a time to prophesy and to witness and to tell people to repent for 1,260 days. This amount of time, again, lines up with which we looked at several weeks ago, Daniel chapter 9 and his prophecy of the 70 weeks. And this 1,260 days lines up with the 70th week. This will be, again, the second half of this seven-year time of tribulation. And, and this is not Mary fleeing with Jesus, because look what it says. Before she flees for the 1,260 days, it says that the child was caught up to God and to his throne. John right there is making reference to the ascension of Jesus. He was born, and then he was ascended after his crucifixion and resurrection to the throne with his father God. 
So she flees, and here's what's awesome. Look at the word nourished. Do you guys see that word? It might be different in your translation. But she's out in the wilderness for 1,260 days, Israel. She will be nourished, which means God will take care of her. Shows us again God continually wanting a relationship with Israel. Nourishing, taking care of. They will flee to the wilderness, the, the people of Israel. Many believe, now we're, we're, we're shifting from, we know that Jesus was born, Satan tried to devour. Now we are shifting and we're going to a future event. These 1260 days that will be in the second half of the tribulation. And many believe this will be people of Israel fleeing to the area of Petra. Has anybody by chance been to Petra here? Okay, cool. Awesome. Petra's an amazing place. I've seen it only on postcards. You're so lucky. No, I'm kidding. I've actually been there. You can ride in on donkey. You can ride in on a horse. Um, I got a, a four-wheeler and ripped the whole place. No, I'm just kidding. But you can go in, and there is caves. There's rocks. There's places to. you could hide. I mean, there's buildings carved out of the sides of walls. It is a magnificent place. But this is where many believe that these people during this time will flee to. And in fact... There is talk that Christian businessmen have actually funded and gone out and placed resources in some of these areas that will hopefully be there for when this happens for those that flee into the wilderness. Things that would nourish them. Tracks, scripture, Bibles, things that talk about Jesus, evangelistic material that will be there waiting for these people that will flee to the wilderness. That's pretty amazing. When you think of he will nourish, and maybe that's going to be through people today that are saying, let's go and, and, and you guys might say, there's no way people would do that. I'll tell you there is. People are crazy. They do all sorts of stuff. If you ever heard of the thing, if you guys have never heard of this, it's pretty awesome thing called geocaching. Anybody heard of geocaching? So if you have kids, this is great. If you're an adult, it's great. If you're a couple and you're looking for something fun to do, try geocaching. There are little caches or things that people have placed all over, all around the world. And they give you just, all you get is the GPS coordinates. And you go and you look for it. Sometimes they're in the desert. Sometimes they could be in a pole right out here that you find a hole in a pole and there's a little capsule with something in it prize or a, a map to the next location. How cool would it be to, to think that maybe there's people today that are saying, let's, let's leave things of nourishment for these people that will flee out to this area. Pretty amazing. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to wrap up 1260 days. And then the rest of the chapter, it's kind of interesting. We see the woman Israel. We see um, we see the child Jesus. We see the dragon trying to devour the child Jesus. And then we're told of this war that happens in heaven. And this would be pre-fall of Satan. This is what led to his fall. Verse 7 says, A war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels, again, those stars, the third of stars that fell that he swept with his tail, were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice, verse 10, in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ, of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God and they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony for they love not their lives even unto death therefore rejoice verse 12 O heavens and you who dwell in them but woe to you O earth and sea for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. We're going to stop right there. And I want to close this up by really, I think, looking at the fact that what we see here in chapter 12 is a big picture of really from Genesis to Revelation. So in Genesis, as we saw that enmity between Satan and the woman, 
we know that Satan, the devil, as he was an angel in heaven, and I'm going to just see how good you guys have been following along. We saw a few chapters of the throne room of God, and what was one of the things we looked at that takes place continually in the throne room? Worship. So think about this. The devil, who was an angel, he saw firsthand the worship that took place in heaven. The continual worship of God, creator of heaven and earth. The devil then starts to get a little thing that we all struggle with at times. Pride. And he says, I want to be higher. I want to be worshipped. He saw God being worshipped and the devil rebels. And we see this war take place in heaven as he falls to the earth. As the devil falls, his next step is to get man to fall with him. Why well, I fell down, and I'm going to get man to fall down with me. You know, there's nothing worse than you, if you see memes or videos of people like it's snow or there's ice on the ground and they're slipping and they're falling. And, and um, we all would hope that we'd have a friend that if maybe they slipped and fell before us, they would say, hey, watch out for right there. That, you you want to be careful. You're going to fall right there. See, the devil, though, he, he fell and, and his fall was great. And we know that he fell to the earth filled with anger and rage. And it tells us because he knew his time was short. But see, the devil is not a friend that would say, hey, you, you don't want to fall. I, I've fallen and it's not good. You want to watch out for that right there. Now, the devil came and he said, you know what? I, I need to get them to fall just like I fell. I need to get them to sin and rebel against the creator. And all for the purpose and the hope of him being worshipped. See, he's done all that he can do to get the truth to be suppressed and hidden. And I wholeheartedly believe this, and we've talked about this. We are created, and we know this, the Bible, Genesis chapter 1 through 11. I will tell you this, chapter 1 through 11 of Genesis, and you may be aware of this, those chapters of the Bible lay out pretty much everything that the devil has been attacking. The truth. That God is creator of heaven and earth. That God has created you and I. And I wholeheartedly believe that he's created us with the desire to worship. To worship. And the devil has come along and he's played on what he knows that God has uniquely put in us. What if I can get them to worship me. And here's the thing. What he does is he comes in just like we're going to see with the Antichrist that we've been reading about. He comes in and says, let me offer you false peace. Let me, I'll even put this guy in play. You'll think he's the one. I'll line these guys up over here and these politicians and these rulers. And you'll think, oh, that's not the devil. That's, these are real people there. And he will do all these things and we'll think we're going after them. But really, he's behind the scenes controlling it all. And ultimately, it's so that he can then say, now... Now is the time that you have to bow down to me. Now is the time that you have to worship me. See, he came and the only thing his payout will give us, the only thing he can offer us, which is pretty sad, is the consequence of the fall. That's the only thing he can give us. Yet he sure does a good job of making it all look very good. And he knows that we want to worship, so he says, you know what? Let me get you to worship yourself. Let me get you so focused on yourself. Let me get you to, I don't know if you've seen this, but more and more today, it's becoming so common that our emotions, which are good, but emotions today are something that we are seeing people even make their own God. I'm going to base everything off of my emotions. I'm going to take all my, imagine if we made all of our decisions based solely on our emotions. That's what we're seeing today. A lot of people are making decisions based solely on emotions. Emotions, I believe, are given to us by God for us to say, something isn't right. I need to talk to my creator. 
I need to look to my creator for his wisdom and his direction. And then the devil says, well, I, I'm going to get you to worship man. I'm going to get you to worship money. I'm going to get you to worship career. I'm going to get you to worship stars, celebrities. I'm going to get you to worship whatever your, your new hobby is of the month. I'm going to get you to go after that wholeheartedly, and you will worship that. And, and, and again, I don't want to, uh, we, we may not be truly worshiping things, but we need to stop and check to see what is getting most of our attention in our lives. And are those things that we have found ourselves almost saying, I am worshiping. I don't know if you guys are aware of this football starting back up. There's a lot of people that worship football. I, being a pastor, I've seen and I've grown up in church knowing that when football is going on, guess what happens at church? I can't go to church as a football game. Well, have you heard of a new invention that's been around now for about 15 years called the DVR? Well, I got to see it live firsthand. That's okay. It's all right to miss church. And, I'm, and I will be, I'll tell you, I've missed church for things like that before. It's okay. But if you get in the habit of going, you know what? I'm going to put church off again. I'm going to put God off again. Whoo, this is going to ruffle some feathers. But I will tell you this. I think sports are so needed and so great, especially for kids. I'm very supportive. But I will tell you this. I firsthand know, you might think this guy's so hyper spiritual, we're leaving. I believe for sure that the devil is involved in Little League and kids sports. Let's get families every Sunday, then let's get them into travel ball, traveling all over the country and as busy as we can get them. He's involved in whatever can get our distractions, get our attention, that will get our focus, that will get us saying, well, this has got to have all of our devotion. Nothing wrong with any of those things, but when they become the center, there's something wrong. See, this is the big picture. The devil fell. And then he came and said, now I'm going to get man to fall with me. And now that Jesus or God has the plan of his son Jesus that's going to come through Israel, I will pursue Israel. I will go after Israel for that child and I will devour that child. And he was not successful in that. And now he's doing whatever he can to get the truth of the child Jesus out of everybody's vision horizon he wants it replaced with whatever ideology theories anything we'll replace it with science we'll worship that we'll replace it with this we'll worship that but all of it ultimately remember is for us to one day to have to choose now you're gonna have to worship me this is why ladies and gentlemen we need to be wise as serpents and gentle as doves in the time we are in because it's going to get hard. It's going to get difficult. And there's going to be a time where we truly will be told, you want to live in society and do normal things and be able to purchase and buy things and sell things and trade and go to work and get a paycheck. Well, if you're going to do that, then you're going to have to take my mark. And many people will think, no, nah, the devil's not behind this. This is finance. <laughs> the devil is in finance, trust me. He's back there working in all angles of finance. The devil, oh, this can't be the devil. This is just a streamlined thing because cash is dirty and we get germs from money and we, you know, and we, it just all makes sense. We've got it, it will all look like it's right, easy, convenient for all of us. But think about just the, 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 the wisdom even of man that would come along and say, hey, is the best way the easy way? How many coaches did we have maybe growing up that would say, really, you want to go the easy way? You want to go the convenient way? If you want to succeed, you got to put work and effort into it. And there's going to be things that will be presented to us that will be the convenient, most logical, easy way. Why is a serpent's gentle as doves. He is going to do whatever he can to keep you from the child, Jesus. He's going to do whatever he can to keep you from seeing the truth that God created you and that God has been pursuing you and that God sent his only son for you. He's going to do whatever he can to get you to fall with him. 
And the, the, the sad thing is when we fall with the devil, he comes and he rubs our face in it. Look at you. What a failure. You're not even worthy to talk to God. You're not even worthy to have a conversation. Don't even bother or think about praying to him for help. He's not going to talk to you. you. Look what you just did. Look what you fell into. And God's right there saying, no, 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 no. I will pull you out and I will redeem you with my righteous right arm. Amen? Let's pray. God, we want to thank you this morning that we have the big picture. And I know at times when I read a book like Revelation and, uh, Lord, start to study it and look at it, there can be so many things in here that are perplexing, that bring question. And, and, and again, we've talked about these things. Many people come up with ideas of what this or that is, Lord. But when we see the big picture like this, we're reminded that it's always been about you and us. It's always been about you being God and creator and giver of life and the devil trying to destroy life. His payout, if we choose to worship and follow him, is death. Your payout is life and life abundant. Peace, joy, hope, love, gentleness, faithfulness, all, all of the fruits of your spirit, all of who you are, and the devil comes along and says, no, 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 no. Let, me, let me show you what you want to worship. And Lord, we would ask this morning, for any of us that may be here this morning that have found ourselves caught up, fallen, putting something else before you, putting someone else before you, that we find ourselves seeing the truth, our eyes would be opened, and that we would see that you are right there wanting to rescue us. And if that's you this morning, know this, that it has to take the step of you waving your arms up and throwing your arms up saying, yes, rescue me, save me. I want to follow you. I choose to follow you, Jesus. Forgive me. And it will take you acknowledging that he is God, creator of heaven and earth. Maybe you've been stuck and just thinking, well, why isn't he pulling me out? Why isn't he doing it? Why hasn't he saved me yet? But you have to take that first step. He's already done it all of sending his son who died on a cross for your sins, who will give you the hope of eternal life. He's done that. And this morning, what he wants of you is just to say yes to it. Yes, I accept it, Jesus. I accept your work, and I ask that it would take place in my life. It's all you have to do this morning. If you want to be forgiven of your sins, and you want to know that if you were to die today, where you will be going, you surrender to him. And then you pick up your cross and you follow after him. Lord, give us your wisdom. Give us your love like never before. Again, as we've been asking, use us, your church, in these crazy times. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.